and I am your host, Evans Zininga. President Emerson Mnangagwa is attending the 29th conference of the parties, COP29, in Baku, Azerbaijan, focusing on climate change and related issues. The conference, themed In Solidarity for a Green World, brings together global leaders to review progress and chart the future of climate action amid significant political, economic, and environmental challenges. Key aspects of COP29 include climate finance, in which developing nations are demanding increased funding with a goal of $1 trillion annually. President Mnangagwa has met with Azerbaijan's President Ilham Aleif and Guinea-Bissau President Umaro Mbalo and Zimbabweans in Baku, as well as toured some major business units in that country. Now, this is coming at a time when the impact of climate change is vividly pronounced in Zimbabwe. According to the Agricultural Extension Services, 10,000 cattle have so far succumbed to drought in Matebeleland South due to the El Nino-induced drought. The country has so far received insignificant rains and concerns of a continuation of the dry spell in 2025. The government says... 2.3 million cattle are in danger of the current dry spell that has devastated most parts of Zimbabwe. And for a detailed look at COP29, we are now joined by our panelists for the day, a very, very interesting member of the community and uh, with a meteorological uh, a background, chairperson of African Meteorological Society and entrepreneur Freedom Mukanga, and, uh, of course, we have agronomy services head for Sitco Zimbabwe, Mrs. Wendy Mazura. Welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Ivan. Thank, Thank you for having me. Right. Uh, COP29. Let me start with you, Mr. Mukanga. I know you've got a very rich background in the meteorological uh, services area. What has not already been talked about ever since the COP29 has started. What is it all about? Thank you very much, and a good evening to our listeners. So, yes, COP is a uh, very important, it's a very important uh, uh, meeting uh, in the calendar of uh, climate issues. I think uh, from my point of view, what I see which is not being emphasized is the need for financing in Africa. Uh, we are seeing intensity and uh, an increase in intensity and frequency of natural disasters, uh, which is a clear sign that uh, climate change is here. Uh, we have had a number of floods and cyclones in Zimbabwe in the past, and also in this season, expecting had a number of them. Then we are just coming from a uh, drought season, like we have just uh, mentioned in the introduction of this sec section of the program, that uh, drought which you are experiencing in Zimbabwe is quite severe. So all this, uh, you know, to be mitigated, to mitigate the, the adverse impact of all these things. Africa needs investment. Uh, research says we to invest $800 million annually to present losses of up to $3 billion. So that money is what uh, I think is needed, uh, you know, uh, for Africa to be better prepared uh, for these uh, the, the disasters. One of the things which lacks in Africa is uh, infrastructure uh, in terms of uh, meteorology. I'm coming from a background in the field of meteorology. So we lack uh, meteorological uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, you know, globally, Africa accounts for 30% of weather and climate uh, data gaps, which compounds the continent's uh, climate challenges. Uh, so I think as we are talking about financing, we are also talking about how better can we improve our infrastructure, our observation networks, uh, to better focus uh, these uh, phenomena, to better plan, to have robust early warning systems. All these 
serious investment of the, the, the continent is lagging behind in this, uh, this uh, space. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for breaking the ice there. Now, let me come to you, Amai Mazura. You are the first person that comes to my mind whenever I see an issue to do with the farmer. Now, farmers are the biggest stakeholder in this. In, in this year's uh, conferences, the theme the COP29 is running with is in solidarity for a green world. Do you think the farmer today is subscribed to the idea of a green world? Thank you so much, Ivan, for having me and uh, for this opportunity to discuss this very pertinent uh, issue around the farmer's preparedness to accept this green world. Indeed, it's every farmer's dream to have a sustainable way of production, but which is also profitable and also meets their food and um, um, their family needs in terms of their productivity level. So the climate change, unforeseen weather vagaries that we have experienced over the last couple of years have resulted in a false start to the rainy season for the farmer, prolonged wheat season dry spells, increased heat units, floods, El Nino induced drought like what we experienced last season, and also a change in the agroecological zones. This has been something that has really affected our farmers in terms of their planning, their execution of their farming duties. So it's, it's also um, quite uh, interesting and um, uh, pertinent for the farmers to mitigate towards getting a green, sustainable farming environment. Uh, as this also speaks to their end goal. Because for our farming community, you find that uh, it's not only something that they do as an extra um, curricular activity or something that they do to pass time. It's a livelihood, it's a lifestyle. So it's something that they would want to be profitable. It's something that they would want to see how they can also contribute to the benefit of future generations in a sustainable way. Uh, doing uh, farming the environmentally friendly way is something that they are also looking at. So yes, it's quite uh, pertinent. And just to share with you that uh, climate change has really affected our farmers, especially this El Nino that we experienced. Mm. Um, you find that um, it, it resulted uh, in... Um, a lower productivity level, as everyone knows, in the drought period, which was declared a national disaster. But it then went forward to have a ripple effect on the winter season, where our farmers, some of them, failed to even establish a sizable crop of wheat because of the water bodies that had been depleted. And then some of them went on to establish the crop, only to realize later that the water that was in the water bodies was not enough to sustain the crop. So some have had to abandon some of their wheat crop. And uh, some of the crops suffered a lot of moisture stress because they couldn't be irrigated well on time because of the power cuts that were resulting from the lower uh, level of water at the power generation plant. And then you also find that now, uh, uh, moving away from the winter again, getting into the summer season, some farmers would have planted on the 1st of October their summer crops. But then there were failures in terms of the establishment of the early irrigated crop because the water bodies were depleted again. So now the farmers are forced to wait even for the irrigated crop to wait and start planting when they receive effective rain. And as you know that the effective rains have pushed forward now in terms of starting. They are now starting a bit late. We expected them to start around the end of October. Clearly, uh, some, some areas have not even received any rain. They are still waiting. So, indeed, uh, climate change has really affected our farmers. Uh, they remain hopeful and optimistic every season and brings new prospects for them to then uh, make it right and uh, increase productivity. But yes, uh, last season, a lot of farmer singers were banned, uh, lessons were learned. It was a painful season for most farmers in their history of production. So we really hope that um, with some mitigation measures that we are going to share, and uh, also as um, the government has highlighted their um, drive as well, also aligning to COP29, to just uh, have a greener um, um, uh, community, a greener environment. It also speaks to the um, um, aim of every farmer to end up being sustainable because green is the color of life, green breed life. You raise very important points there, uh, my Mazura. Let me come back to you, uh, Ramukanga. Now, developing countries have been saying they blame developed countries for climate change. Interesting facts. The, the next U.S. president, Donald Trump, believes climate change is a hoax. Now, is there any tangible result that you think will come out of the COP29? Yes, I, 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 
I, I strongly think there will be tangible results, um, especially for the benefit of uh, for, for, of Africa. Like as I said, we are the leading causes of climate change, but uh, impact is heavy on us. And also, uh, financial resources uh, to cushion us are very limited. But I think uh, the discussion around uh, uh, financing uh, Africa also benefiting from uh, uh, carbon credit uh, initiatives will help us uh, greatly. I think what's important now, especially if we are looking at, uh, at agriculture and our farmers, is development organizations uh, and the private sector coming up with uh, uh, insurance products like uh, weather index insurance. Uh, these will cushion our farmers post the season. For example, now we're in a drought season and our farmers need to be compensated. Some of them planted in good faith that they will have something. But unfortunately, because the, 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 the drought was severe and dire, they couldn't uh, harvest anything. So I think if uh, the private sector development organizations can come up with innovative ways of uh, cushioning our farmers, uh, that, that will go a long way uh, in, uh, in mitigating things like poverty, itself, hunger, and so, and so forth. Uh, but yeah, data shows that uh, climate change is there. Uh, like I said in my introduction, that we are now seeing uh, an increase in intensity and frequency of uh, uh, these natural uh, uh, phenomena, natural disasters, something which we didn't see before. So it will be very uh, controversial for one to say there is nothing like climate change. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the results let me, are the let, let me. Story. Let me, let me hold you there, Vamukang, I'll come back to you. I've got a very good farmer in uh, Gwanda, in Matebeleland there, who has a, a, a clear picture of what is happening out there. Before I come back to you, let's, let's take the, let's take the farmer, uh, and we, we hear what's happening. We know Matebeleland has already lost 10,000 cattle because of the El Nino induced drought. If you can hear me, Mr. Mkanja, welcome to the show. Then I can hear you. The line is not very, very clear, but I can hear you. Ah, thank you. I can hear you as well. We believe you are in the mix of the action in Mat in Matevelaland, where we hear ten thousand cattle have already died because of this induced drought, and uh, according to figures coming out of the Ministry of Agriculture and Associates, we could expect more to die. What is the situation there? It is terrible, my brother. The situation on the ground is terrible for both people and livestock, but most of the livestock, because there are no grazing lands anymore. There is no water in the river, streams and what, and some bowls are drying and nobody can uh, afford to get uh, bowls to, to get water for all the cattle in the area. And the cattle are dying each and every day. 10,000 may be dropping the ocean. We are facing a situation where a large chunk, a large percentage of cattle in Mark South will be lost to this crowd. Mm. We then go that we are getting different pieces of rain here and there. But the situation on the ground is terrible. As I've said, for both human beings and livestock. So the, uh, the countryside is a region of smell of dead cattle, donkeys, and the goats and sheep. Mm. One more one more question for you, uh, Baba Mkanja. Queen Zakala Nibati the government is chipping in, they're helping farmers out there with stock feeds and other things. What's happening with that in that regard? Well, it's easier said than done, and some of these things is unfortunately that politicians sometimes they turn propaganda in the fact. I have not heard anyone that I know of, I'm, I'm also a rural guy, though I, I live in Gwanda Town, and saying that they've received any stock food from the country. What I know is that people get into groups, syndicates, and try to get stock food on their own. Or sometimes they go it as individuals. Uh, I don't know of any government 
a, a stock seed that has been given to the farmers. I don't know. It may have reached some places, but I don't know of anybody who has received a direct assistance on stock seed from the gardening. People are taking care of themselves either in, uh, in groups or as families or just as individuals. Mm -hmm. Nothing that has come across. Uh -huh. I have not seen so, any activity again uh, to try to get water for the livestock. If the situation on the ground is bad, as if the government was uh, not aware. I see Abonga Babam Kanta. We will come back to you in future programs as we keep checking on updates on what's happening in Matebele Land there. Let me move back to you, Amai Mazura. Now, the farmer is our biggest stakeholder here. If there was money available to help with climate change issues in Zimbabwe, what would you say are the key needs to attend to for today's farmer? So in terms of uh, mitigating the effects of uh, climate change that our farmers are facing, I would say one of the key issues that we need to look at is the issue to do with irrigation. Because you find that with climate change, it has really affected the rainfall pattern where you find that in terms of the agroecological regions in Zimbabwe, we have seen a shrinkage in some regions and an expansion in the drier regions, where you find that there were some areas that were previously in regions that received more rainfall, like the agroecological regions where um, we can receive more than 250 millimeters, which is region 3, the same intensive farming region, you find that it has extended to some parts that are predominantly we're not receiving, uh, we're receiving more rainfall. A part like Loma, Mangura, they used to receive more rainfall, but they've become drier over the past couple of years. And you're seeing that we have an, uh, an extension or an introduction of a region 5B, which is now extensive farming and receiving more than 400, less than 400 millimeters of water. So without irrigation, really our farming will not go anywhere. We need to capacitate our farmers, large scale, small scale, um, in groups for them to irrigate their crops because we still have some significant water bodies that can sustain irrigation. But it's a matter of rehabilitation of the irrigation scheme, also capacitation of the farmers in terms of irrigation equipment, also just tailor making the irrigation equipment to the nature of farming that the farmers will be doing. Is it small scale? Is it large scale? Do they need pivots? They need more of deep irrigation because they need a sustainable, small-scale method of intensifying their productivity. So I would say irrigation is a low-hanging fruit that we really need to make sure that we invest in. But um, it's also commendable that the government has made significant efforts in capacitating our farmers um, without all the figures, because I'm sure the authorities with figures can also share more light. But I understand that a lot of goals were being set up through the Ministry of Agriculture. And also we are seeing that the rehabilitation of the irrigation scheme is also underway. Some dams are being constructed. Some are being widened and deepened. So there are efforts to capacitate our farmers in terms of irrigation mm -hmm. um, and making sure that they are aligned. Then another thing that we can also do uh, as a collective to support our farmers is to make sure that they understand the importance of ecological mapping, whereby their crop productivity should be guided by the crop that is suitable for their region, also in line with the rainfall that they receive, especially for those with a 100% rain-fed cropping. So this is another thing that we need to make sure that extension and also capacitation of our farmers. Am I, am I Mazura? You, you are a yes. preacher in this ministry. Let me hold you there so we can give <laughs> Vam, 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 Vam Kanga a chance also to say yes, a few okay. words before we close. Uh, Mr. Mukanga, right. expectations out of the COP 2019 as we close briefly. Yeah, I think uh, Africa needs investment in infrastructure. We are talking about weather stations. We need more. We need to bring fire weather station networks in Africa. We need satellite receivers. We need uh, uh, equipment which will help us improve weather prediction and our agricultural outcomes and disaster preparedness will, will improve. Without that, we just be guessing. So that's my uh, plea for the uh, uh, expert white cop. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you both uh, for being our guest today on the show and uh, to our valued uh, listeners and uh, viewers from wherever you are in the world. We thank you as well for being on the show today. A quick update on life after the U.S. election. 
as the incoming administration of U.S. President-elect Donald Trump begins to take shape, questions around how he will implement his campaign promises or even whether he will seek retribution against his adversaries are in the minds of many Americans. Progressives, meanwhile, are reflecting on their White House laws. VOA's Veronica Balderas Iglesias reports. After a decisive electoral victory, all eyes are now on President-elect Donald Trump and how he will govern. His supporters believe that even those Americans who didn't vote for the former president will see their lives improve. I think a lot of people across the country, even who have bought into, I think, some false narratives about Donald Trump, are going to be pleasantly surprised as to finding more money in their paycheck, prices coming down in the country, a secure border. With the selection of Susie Wiles as Trump's chief of staff, the president-elect's administration is already taking shape. The former president took to his truth social media platform Saturday to make clear, however, that neither former U.S. ambassador to the U.N. Nikki Haley nor Trump's former secretary of state Mike Pompeo will be invited to join his cabinet this time around. Meanwhile, questions have been raised about whether Trump will act on promises he's made to seek revenge against his political enemies and those who have pursued legal cases against him. I'm going to tell you what Donald Trump has said on this time and again. Success will be our retribution. Success will be our vengeance. While I concede... For those who supported the Democratic presidential campaign of Vice President Kamala Harris, this is a time of reflection. The working class of this country is angry, and they have a reason to be angry. We are living in an economy today, Donna, where the people on top are doing phenomenally well, while 60 percent of our people are living paycheck to paycheck. While praising the Biden administration's achievements, Senator Sanders said there's more work to be done. We need an agenda that says to the working class, we're going to take on these powerful special interests and create an economy and a government that works for you. And by the way, That can't happen unless you get big money out of politics. U.S. President Joe Biden has promised there will be a peaceful transfer of power on January 20th. Biden called Trump to congratulate him after his election win, and the two are scheduled to meet in person Wednesday at the White House. Veronica Valderas Iglesias, VOA News, Washington. And now moving closer to home where the El Nino-induced drought is causing mayhem, Malawi with the help from the World Food Program, has received its first shipment of more than 19,000 tons of maize from Ukraine. The food aid will help feed millions of Malawians currently dealing with food shortages exacerbated by El Nino-induced drought. Lamek Masina reports from Blantyre. The assistance to Malawi comes under the Grain from Ukraine initiative the country's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, launched in November 2022. The aim of the initiative is to provide Ukrainian grain and other food supplies to countries experiencing food crises. Ukraine's ambassador to Kenya, Andriy Prevadik, came to Malawi to witness the food's arrival. He says the assistance is payback for the support Malawi has shown for Ukraine in its war with Russia. Malawi is one of the few African countries which supported and continue to support Ukraine in defending our sovereignty and territorial integrity, and in particular by voting in favor of all UN resolutions de- uh, demanding Russia to withdraw its troops from Ukrainian territory. Malawi is facing one of its worst humanitarian situations in the decades after a prolonged dry spell blamed on El Nino, severely reduced nation's agricultural outputs, leaving 5.7 million people short of food. The World Food Program is coordinating the delivery and distribution of relief food assistance to the hardest hit areas in Malawi. The UNS Food Agency previously obtained food from Tanzania, Kenya and South Africa, but says it has now extended the search elsewhere because of limited means availability in those countries. The capacity that we need here 
means that we've had to import from further afield. So we've been assisted by the Green from Ukraine initiative, uh, which has been funded in our case by Sweden, Netherlands, France and uh, Korea. So we've had good support from the, from the donors and also we're a partner with Ukraine on the initiative. The donors have pledged further commitment in assisting countries most affected by climate change related disasters. And France is also next year hosting the Nutrition for Growth conference. So for us, the answer to such issues is to come together and try and support the most climate change affected countries in the world. Officials in Malawi welcome the Ukrainian assistance. As Malawi, we really appreciate uh, the uh, response that we have received this far, uh, that we can be able to say uh, up to December we are okay and uh, we are still mobilizing to make sure that uh, we get to March. The WFP, however, says it urgently needs $63 million to fully meet the needs of food insecure communities in Malawi. Without such support, it says millions could face even greater hunger. Lamik Masina, VOA News, Blanta, Malawi. And this brings us to the end of today's edition. We will bring you more shows as we go on. And I am signing off in Washington. This is Evans Zeninga.